If you don't believe what goes around comes around, the next time you see somebody down, just smile at them. Just say hello and be friendly toward them. And you'll see that what you send out is what comes back. Now that law of the universe is so powerful that it affects every cell in your body. Every cell in your body. When you look at one cell in your body, ask yourself what makes the cell work? What makes a cell in your body work? Do you know what makes one individual little cell work? Harmony and cooperation. That's how cells work. An individual cell. If what's inside that cell, the electrons, the neutrons, and the protons, and all that physics stuff that's inside one, if any of them get out of whack and start not cooperating or not working in harmony, what happens to the cells around it? They're affected in some way, aren't they? When one individual cell is affected in a negative way, that is, when it loses its harmony, when it loses its cooperation, then it affects negatively those cells around it. And that's the disease, all right? And that spreads to another cell and to another cell. And before long, the harmony within you is, you know, physiologically, is destroyed. There's two kinds of energy, supposedly, in every cell. One is the physics energy. Shirley MacLaine talks about this in her wonderful book, Out on a Limb. Uh, I recommend you read it. She talks about the physics of what is energy within one cell. And then that there's another kind of energy within a cell that scientists and physicists and chemists, none of us can figure out what it is, but it is what makes the whole thing work. They just call it the source. And that source, the nearest they can get to is love or cooperation or harmony, what we call love, which is just love. It's just cooperating and being in harmony with. All right? That's what love is. And that that is what makes every single cell work. <laughs> And when one doesn't work right, it affects the other cells. Now, for a minute, just for a minute, think of yourself as a cell, just as one big cell, okay? Now, one of us as a cell goes out of whack, goes amok, doesn't work right in some way. Does it affect those around us? One cell gone wrong can affect all the other cells around us. It's just a growth process, seeing bigger and bigger cells. But when you think about the entire size of our universe, which is endless, which we can't even begin to comprehend what endless means and uncaused causes and so on, then you are as big as one of those tiny little cells inside of you. And if you go amok in some way, then you affect those around you. And if our planet, which is just another cell, in billions and billions and billions of other cells, if our whole planet goes amok, that is, if we store up enough weapons and we do enough killing and we have enough hate and as a people we do that then we will not only affect everything down to that tiny little cell but all the cells in our planet in our universe and it will go on forever see I have taken to sending out ICUS a copy of my parable I send these books out to all influential people in the world in every field just the last two weeks I think our mailing lists have totaled over 4,000 at my own expense, just signing them and sending them out to all the government leaders, all the medical leaders, all education leaders, all people in celebrities data, all the people associated with different religions and so on. I'm just sending them out. All right? Now, many times when you send things out in the mail to a large mailing list, you get some back. Karma. Understanding how our universe works. In every single obstacle that you run into in your life, there's an opportunity. Every obstacle you have is a hidden opportunity. And seeing it, rather than as something to complain about or call your lawyer about or get upset about or, or anything in between, you see there is an opportunity in every setback you have in life, including everything you're suffering from right now. Everything, whatever it may be. There's an opportunity in it. Look for the opportunity. Look for the fulfillment, the potential for finding out what you're made out of, rather than for finding out how well you can say, see... I told you things weren't going to work out for me. <laughs> so I, in sending out these books, I'll get 100 back. You send out 4,000, you get 100 back, that's a good day. Okay, uh, only 100 came back. Now, most people who send things out free and get some back say, well, this isn't working, I'm getting these back, I get 100 back and all that. To me, it's like, how can I find that person? This is a test. To me, that's a test from the universe to say, what are you made of? You're just going to give up and not find that person? 
Or are you going to uh, go look for that person because that's to find out what you're made out of. And that's what I do with all of that and have always done. And somehow just knew to do that. When it's somebody says no, it's how can I figure out a way to go around that no? Rather than I think that they're right, I'll just give up. It's always how can I get around that? It's all of it is there to teach us something, something grand and something delightful and that helps us move to higher and more spiritual places. So the way that you adver <coughs> eliminate adversity is literally to uh, be thankful for it and to say thank you for everything, everything that is showing up in my life. Uh, it is going to teach me something, something profound. And some of the most difficult and, and very troublesome kinds of things that have occurred to me in my life, what I thought were at the time, have taught me how to be a better writer, a better speaker, a, a kinder person, a, a better human being. Because true nobility, it's not about being better than other people. It's about being better than you used to be. And the way that you get better at being the, uh, you know, than you used to be is by having these challenges show up and then, uh, and then transcending them and get overcoming them. I don't look back on my days of drinking, which uh, stopped 17 years ago, as anything other than great, great and wonderful events that helped me. All of that drinking and all of the behavior and the drugs that I did and all of those kinds of things have helped me to become a stronger, more purified, uh, more, more decent, better human being, better husband, better father, better, better, uh, you know, better speaker, uh, better man as a person. Anyway, you, let me try to get through the rest of these. We just have a few moments. Left. Okay. Were you going to say something, Diane? Well, I was going to say, do you think people get caught up in the why me kind of mentality? Yeah, I think they do. Instead of saying, why not me? You know, so, thank right. you. Thank you for all of it, every single bit of it. I mean, there's a slogan here on Maui that says, no rain, no rainbows. You know, so I always remind people of that whenever there's a rainy day and the tourists are all here and they're all upset about the rain. I say, but you see all those rainbows that you just love every day? They have rainbows over here on the island. You can't have them without the rain. And I think it's a good symbol for our lives. Um, one of the things that Gandhi said uh, that's really, tr I think, very important is that there's more to life than, than making things go faster and making it always uh, increase our speed. That the idea that we have to get there fast, we have to be ahead of the other person, slowing ourselves down in the, in the, in the 26th verse of the Tao that I was writing about this morning, uh, it talks about the stillness, about, about being able to, uh, that stillness is the, is the mother of unrest. In other words, in order, the master of unrest. In other words, in order to be able to get to a place where you are no longer filled with unrest, you have to go to this place of stillness, this place of quiet, this place of peace that is within each and every one of us. And that means not telling yourself that you have to be there ahead of the other guy, not rushing through the traffic lights, but meditating your way through the, when a yellow light comes, instead of rushing through it instead, you know, that, that's just a habit. Instead of that, just slowing down, putting your foot on the brake and saying, thank you. Thank you for one minute to just sit here and be at peace and be kind and be, and be in a, in a sense of harmony with my source, which is always at peace. Also, I said, do everything that you, that do everything that you can to eliminate debt in your life because all of the debt that you have, the credit card debt, the money that you owe, the banks, the mortgages, all of those kinds of things are a way of giving up control of your life and putting it into the hands of someone who, who will be controlling the purse strings of your life. And also to let go of your idea about everything uh, is evaluated on the basis of how much it costs or how much it's worth. Uh, try to take the dollar value off of things and just enjoy everything in your life for what it is. I'm actually, I'm going through something right now, and I'm kind of wanting to know why all this is happening to me in my life. At 15, my dad died unexpectedly of, you know, uh, an aortic aneurysm, and then we, I dealt with that somewhat decent. I don't want to say great, but I was only 15, and then I got married, and my husband and I struggled for four and a half years to get pregnant with one miscarriage along the way. And we got pregnant in November last year. We found out December 8th. And then on April 4th, we found out that the baby was really sick. Mm -hmm. And I ended up delivering a stillborn on April 19th. Mm -hmm. And I'm just not quite sure why all this is happening and how to get through it. Yeah, I, I can hear your pain. Um, first of all, you, 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 you know, as you, as you move along the, the, this path that I'm writing about, especially on inspiration, you, you find out that... Um, all of the greatest teachers who've ever walked among us, including Jesus, uh, all of them, have uh, taught us that death is not a, it's not a punishment, that it is, it, is, uh, it is the inevitability of all things, that everything that composes decomposes. And the question is, isn't whether it's going to decompose. The question that we have as human beings is, how long is it going to take? How much time do we get? 
Uh, when you say the words, my father died unexpectedly, my immediate response to that is unexpected to you. Yeah. But, but not to God. And not, you know, and that the moment that your father was conceived and the moment that he showed up on this planet, his birth was here, uh, independent of his opinion about it, and so was his death. And the same is true of the of the miscarriages that you've had and the and the stillborn the stillbirths that you've had. That um, that there's a perfection in all of this, and that these souls who who showed up very very temporarily and then for whatever reason uh, that none of us will ever be privy to um, weren't ready to show up in, into this into this world. What hap- What you are doing with it is you're taking it personally. You're 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 saying to yourself. That, why me? And how could something so terrible as this happen? And how much of this kind of thing do I have to put up with before I'll have peace in my life? And I'm saying yeah. to you, have peace in your life now and, and, and even be in a state of gratitude for the, just the fact that you've been able to, you've been able to participate in the dance of life. You've already created life twice. Uh, and, and because it didn't last as long as you thought it should last, um, it's just, it's, that's just, a, that's just our ego at work. That's- you may believe that the opposite of love is hate. I do not see these two emotions as opposites. In fact, love and hate are often closely aligned. To me, the opposite of love is fear. When you have fear, you do not have love. Ego uses fear as a way to keep authentic love out of your life. When love is not present in your life, you have succumbed to ego and allowed fear in where love could be. You have allowed ego to replace God. Learning to experience authentic love means abandoning ego's insistence that you have much to fear and that you are in an unfriendly world. This begins with an assessment of your reluctance to embrace love. If you are not experiencing love in your life right now, it is because you are, in some way, afraid. You need to examine your fears with honesty and with love. When you do, you will transform your fears into love. You will open up a space within you that can only be occupied by love. In this space you are on purpose, walking the way of the sacred self. But first, you must see how you substitute fear for love. Your ego steadfastly promotes fear because it fears authentic love itself. This false self helps you convince yourself that you are in some way incomplete. That is the source of all fear. Afraid of having your emptiness, your incompleteness exposed, you expend a lot of energy creating a false image of happiness. The fear about exposing the emptiness keeps you seeking relationships that ego tells you will satisfy the longing within you. What happens is that you enter a relationship, starved for the love that is your higher self. Your inner hunger is masked, pretending to be something else. No wonder so many people repeatedly think they have found love and repeatedly declare they've lost it. How different it is when you can notice the inner emptiness and think, what's not to like? This longing is part of being human and knowing love. Then you will let ego know that fear is not your choice. Love is your choice. Just imagine how our system might be if people knew they were already complete. What would you need to purchase? What would you need to have to own? Who would you have to impress? Who would you need to have on your arm? The answers give you an idea of how much we rely on the fear that we are incomplete and unacceptable as we are and how unaware we are of our divine connection. The fear that is a substitute for love is simply a fear of being unacceptable. Virtually all fears can be traced directly back to self-esteem. If you love yourself, you will be able to transform your fears with love rather than allow them to direct your life. If you have an inner feeling of being complete and whole, knowing the loving presence that is there, then fear becomes a loving invitation to know more or to change something in your life. Fear will no longer threaten you as it did when you were unacquainted with your higher self. The inability to rely on the love that is our very essence shows up in many forms. Your ego wants you to believe that you are unacceptable and will gleefully assist you in creating an image to prove that it is so. Manifestations like obesity and personal slovenliness and eating disorders often are the fear-based projection of yourself. Ego can influence you to shun all efforts to be loved by others by refusing to allow the risk of an intimate encounter or the development of an intimate relationship. Ego often makes you selfishly pursue your own goals at others' expenses. You engage in perpetual conversation about yourself. We often use economic, social, and other types of excuses to defend behavior that does not extend love. For instance, you might excuse unloving or inconsiderate behavior because it's only my job or because everyone else does it. Expressions of disgust or rudeness towards others are based on ego. They are heard in stores, on freeways, in offices, at airports, in restaurants, any place you are in your daily life. 
These are some of the common expressions of a fear-based ego struggling to keep you away from the experience of love that is your true essence. Before you begin to change these behaviors and thought patterns, you need to examine the payoffs. What is some part of your receiving as a payoff for listening intently to ego? Your ego works for its living. Its payoff is not money, but just in keeping alive. Your ego is not open to making contact with God because it would be immediately put out of business. Your ego is in direct conflict with your true purpose for being there. You are here to give and receive love. Your ego protects you from that vision by keeping you in a belief system that declares you are separate and special. By hanging on to the fears of your insufficiency, you can avoid taking any risk. As long as you have self-doubt and all of its attendant fears, you are guaranteed to stay in servitude to your false self. Your ego thrives on guilt. Your higher self knows that you should forgive yourself, learn from mistakes, and release feelings of fear and anxiety. But ego hands you guilt so that it will thrive. Guilt is the inner fear that you should pay a price for any and all mistakes you have committed in your life. Thus the ego convinces you that you must feel guilty and it keeps you removed from your true spirit. Your ego doesn't reject love. The polite background ego voice whispers that love is a high ideal, but one that is loaded with danger. It warns you to not give too much love because you may be taken advantage of. Because you are so special, it tells you others want to take advantage of you. Ego promotes inauthentic love. In your relationships with others, your ego convinces you that your partner is just what you need to fill the emptiness within you. This is a great ruse that will forever keep you from knowing love and peace. Make a copy of this passage from Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Tape it to your mirror and read it every morning. It will help stimulate the inner opening to the love you seek and dissolve fears if you are willing to do what the poet suggests. He says, I exist as I am. That is enough. If no other in the world be aware, I sit content. And if each and all be aware, I sit content. One world is aware, and by far the largest to me, and that is myself. And whether I come to my own today or in 10,000 or 10 million years, I can cheerfully take it now, or with equal cheerfulness, I can wait. Remind yourself that God created you in perfect love that is changeless and eternal. As you recognize and affirm this aloud each day, you will lose your fear of inadequacy and incompleteness. Constantly recalling the affirmation of being a creation of God beyond the world of the manifest will chase the fears away. Forgive yourself and welcome love back into your life. A lot of people are looking for the how-tos. You know, how can I become a more spiritual person? Or how can I find my purpose? Uh, and they start with the way that they learn anything. Problem solving logic. A plus B plus C plus D equals whatever it is. And, and you just go through the steps. It's not like that. When you consider that everything that you have done in your life has led you up until this moment that you have right now, and all of the things that you have assessed to be negative, all of the addictions perhaps that you've had, all of the problems you've had in your marriages, all the problems you've had with your children, all of the weight problems perhaps that you've had, all of the difficulties that have come your way, the financial concerns and the bankruptcies and all of the stuff that if you were to reach into your bag, you know, you could pull out this whole bag full of uh, negative stuff. You get to a point that the Buddhists call satori, S-A-T-O-R-I. Satori. It means um, instant enlightenment. Instant enlightenment. And the Buddhists believe, by and large, that enlightenment is something that happens in instants. It happens in moments. It's like I've talked about at some of my other tapes about going through the gate. You know, it's like on one side of the gate is uh, the path that is strewn with thorns, all right? And there's all of the stuff that I have just described. And then there's this gate ahead of you. And then on the other side of the gate is this garden. And there's this flowers, and it's just magnificent, and there's happiness, and there's bliss, and there's fulfillment, and there's all of this wonderful stuff on the other side. But you can't get through the gate. And then comes the moment in your life when you go through the gate. You just go through. You know, the thorns that were there don't matter anymore. The obstacles are no longer obstacles. It's just a, and it's like,
boom, instantaneously, you are now on a different path altogether. I can tell you that for those of you who are struggling and trying to find a formula and trying to get it all into A, B, C, D, E, F, it isn't that way. First of all, all of the thorns and all of the obstacles that have been created in your life are there for a reason, even though it's, it, that's a hard thing for us to accept. There's something to be learned from each one of those. And so instead of saying, how can I avoid these in the future, you reprocess your life in a different way and say, I created this for what reason? And I'm going through this because, and, and you fill in the blanks, or the lesson in this for me is, right, instead of why is this happening to me and isn't this awful and so on. And then satara happens. And I mean, that was very revealing for me to read about this instant enlightenment. Because every major change that I've made in my life, I mean, they don't seem like major, big changes, but the changes that I've made in my, happened in instants. I mean, just in seconds. Now, in the physical world of changes that I have made, I can remember when I first decided that I was going to start running and exercising and get myself in shape instead of being overweight and out of shape like I had been. In an instant, in an instant, and it was a doctor at a hospital where I wasn't a patient, I was working there. I was training the staff in group therapy at North Shore Hospital on Long Island. And this doctor said one thing to me. He said, uh, if you continue on the path that you're on, you're going to be a candidate for a heart attack in five years. He wasn't trying to be helpful to me. He wasn't anything. He just was making a statement. And that evening, I went out and I ran for the first time as an adult. And it's now almost 15 years later, and I haven't missed a day of running in 15 years. It was just like an instant kind of thing, and then it was like carrying through on that. And I mean, that really flies in the face of a lot of the stuff that we hear all the time about you have to have a goal, and you have to have a plan, and you have to get it all figured out, and you have to work step by step by step. I really think that enlightenment, or discovering this inner source of strength, is something that just happens in an instant whenever you're ready. So whoever you are, I mean, if you're smoking, if you're drinking excessively, if you've got addictive habits in your eating habits and so on, if you are behaving in ways with your children or with your wife or, or co-workers or whatever, and you think that it's just hopeless and that you can't change and that it's just too difficult to process and so on, I'm really saying to you that in an instant you can decide to radically alter your life. And it isn't like even a decision-making process. You're now ready. The same Buddhists say that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. I tell people, supposing you went to sleep and you had a dream, and in your dream you had, um, oh, all these different characters, and, and you had all of this money, and you had everything that you wanted in your dream. And then you woke up. And then you look back at your dream, and you became attached to the stuff that you had in your dream. He said, wait a minute, I want that. There was gold in there. There was silver. There was all of these friends. I had a Ferrari there. I mean, all of this. I got to have that. Somebody would come away and cart you off and put you in a rubber room and say, that was a dream. You can't be attached to that. That's just a thought that you have. That's the way you got to view life. Instead of it being an eight-hour dream, it's an 80-year dream or a 90-year dream. And at the end of the dream... You don't want to be looking back at all of the stuff that you wish you could still have because you can't have it. <laughs> you don't get any of that. So you try to detach yourself now while you're here, while you're alive, from the need to have that stuff. Instead, you just let it sort of all flow. As absurd as it would be for you to be attached to the stuff that you had in your dream, it's that absurd for you to be attached to the stuff that you're having in this dream. <laughs> you have to die while you're alive. Now, that's a very hard concept for people to get. But you have to experience your own death while you're alive. Let me tell you a story. It's a wonderful story. It's an old, ancient story. I'll paraphrase it. There was a, a hunter who lived in India. And he would go to Africa every two years. And he would bring back animals and prizes and things like that. Well, one year he took off and he went to the jungle... And he discovered this large enclave inside the jungle. And it was filled with beautiful parrots, beautiful birds, multicolored, and they all talked. And he couldn't get over it. 
and he put a net out over one of the trees, and he captured one of the parrots. And he put the parrot in a cage, and he brought the parrot back to be with him in India as his pet. And he fed the parrot sunflower seeds, and he fed him rice, and he took wonderful care of him. He was very good. Kept him in the cage. Two years went by, and he talked to the parrot every day. And he said to the parrot, I'm now going back to Africa. Is there anything you would like me to say to your friends back there in the jungle when I'm back there? The parrot said, yes. Tell them that I'm very happy in my cage. Tell them that I'm joyful and that I love being in my cage here with you. Just tell them that. The hunter went back to Africa. He went back to the place in the jungle where he had been two years before. And he told the story. He said, your friend that I took back has a message for you. And the message is that he is happy in his cage, that he is joyful with me, and that he has no regrets. At the instant of hearing that, a bird on one of the branches keeled over and dropped dead. Dropped dead. <sniffs> Stiff. The hunter assumed that he was just filled with sorrow at hearing of what had happened to his uh, friend. So he went back to India, and he told his parrot what had happened. He said, I went back and I did just as you said. And I told them all out there. And at the moment that I told it, apparently one of the parrots was so upset that he'd missed you so much that he just dropped dead. And at the instant that that happened, the parrot in the cage keeled over dead. His legs went straight up in the air, and he went stiff. The hunter was beside himself. He, he couldn't figure out how could this happen. And he took the dead parrot out of the cage, opened it up, and threw it out on the woodpile. The instant that the parrot landed on the woodpile, he flew up to the branch. And the hunter said, you tricked me. What is this? I thought you were dead. And the parrot said, my friend was sending me a message. He told me, by his actions, that in order for you to escape from your cage, you must die while you're alive. Okay, now that's an old story. That's an ancient story that's been told over the years. What does it mean? <laughs> I mean, don't you see that this is a cage? That the whole planet is a cage? If you can just stand back far enough and see that we're still restricted by the limitations placed on us as human beings. We're stuck here, or maybe in our homes, or in wherever we are. We're all in cages. And even though we have more room to manipulate, we may even have a whole planet. We're still sort of in cages. Now, how do you escape from the cage that you're in? You have to die while you're alive. You have to literally experience your own death. All of us have to. All of us are going to die. So why not experience it in advance? and see yourself out of your body, gone, but able to look back at what's going on now. Just like the dream, where you have the dream and you have everything you want, but you're able to look back at it. As you do that, you begin to see the folly, the absurdity of hanging on to anything, of being attached to anything, of needing anything, of telling yourself that I can't be happy if, from the perspective of having died. But being able to look back on it, just like the dream, as soon as you can do that, as soon as you can experience yourself formless, dimensionless, form and all of the attendant things that you hang on to become irrelevant. They're not necessary any longer. You have a whole new way of living, a new way of being. 